Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave. If you've not met me before, um, it's great to see you. I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone. Um, this morning, we're going to be continuing with our series, thinking through some of the key things that we believe um, as a church. And this morning, we're going to be thinking about what the Bible says about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to be reading or thinking, looking at a few different passages this morning, um, but I'm just going to read one passage. Uh, there are two on the handout, but I think we'll just read one um, from John chapter 16. We'll get to John 3 uh, later. So if you could open up your Bibles and turn to page 1084. John chapter 16, uh, verse 1 to 15. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes... He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Well, um, we're thinking about the the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And John mentioned last week, as a church, we hold to the FIEC statement of faith. And um, that isn't because we think the FIEC has a a God-given authority to tell us what to believe. Um, That's not the reason that we hold to it. We hold to it because we think that statement faithfully, um, correctly summarizes what the Bible says about these important biblical doctrines. And here, I just want to to read you, um, I think it should come up on the screen, what the FIEC Statement of Faith says about the Holy Spirit. So this is what it says. The Holy Spirit has been sent from heaven to glorify Christ and to apply his work of salvation. He convicts sinners, imparts spiritual life, and gives a true understanding of the scriptures. He indwells all believers, brings assurance of salvation, and produces increasing likeness to Christ. He builds up the church and empowers its members for worship, service, and mission. This morning, what I want to do is is kind of work through most of the things in that paragraph, which is why, um, if you're following on the handout, um, the welcome sheet, there are a lot of headings. Um, Don't worry, this sermon will not be uh, longer than normal, much longer than normal, don't worry. Um, uh, It will be a great help as well um, to you and to me. If you can keep John 16 open, we'll be coming back to it a few times. Let, Let me pray. Let's pray for God's help. Father God, um, we we pray in our time this morning, please would you help us to understand your word as we consider the the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to appreciate him and his work in our lives and in our church and in the world. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the, the, idea of, the ideas of father and the ideas of son, I think they are understandable ideas, aren't they, for us? They are concepts that we can get our heads around because we have experience of them. But the idea of spirit seems much more vague, I think, doesn't it? And the Lord Jesus had a physical body. Um, We can visualize that in some way. But the Holy Spirit didn't assume a human body. Um, In fact, the Holy Spirit in the Bible is often pictured as fire or wind or a dove. And that, I think, is maybe one of the reasons we we get a bit confused about the Holy Spirit. makes it difficult for us to um, understand him and his work. Who is he? What is he like? What does he do? And that's certainly been my experience um, in in church, in most of the churches that I've been part of in the past. People didn't really speak much about the Holy Spirit because I think they weren't really sure what to say. I think generally we know that the Holy Spirit is important. Perhaps we understand that he has a role to play in us becoming Christians. But what about today? What about now? Does he have a role, active role in my life today? Now, your church background might be very different to mine. Um, Some Christians don't speak much about the Holy Spirit. Others speak about the Holy Spirit a great deal. How should we think and speak about the Holy Spirit? How should we understand his role in our world, in our lives, in the church? I've got two big headings for us to think about. Firstly, we're going to think about the work, uh, who is the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. That's heading number one. And the second big heading is we're going to think about the work of the Holy Spirit. What is his role? And we won't spend as long on the first. We're going to spend much longer on the second. So who is the Holy Spirit? You know, the most basic thing we could say in answer to that question is that the Holy Spirit is a divine being. He is fully God. He shares the same essence with the Father And with the Son, he is equal with them. He's not the same as them. He is distinct from the Father. He is distinct from the Son. But he has equal honor with them. One of the most frequent names given to the Holy Spirit in the Bible is the Spirit of God. And the name, the Holy Spirit, speaks of his divinity as well, doesn't it? Just as God is holy... Just uh, as God is holy, so the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He's a divine being. And I think it's really important for us to recognize, not only is he a divine being, he is a personal being. The Holy Spirit is a he and not an it. We can see that really clearly in the Bible. Just listen to some of the things that we're told the Holy Spirit does. We're told that he can grieve. We're told he intercedes for people. He testifies. He speaks. He creates. He has a mind. He can be blasphemed. These are all things that only a personal being can do. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he's someone that we can know. Just as we can know the Father. And just as we can know The Son. Sometimes Christians mistakenly think of the Holy Spirit or talk about the Holy Spirit as an impersonal force, a power or an energy. And we need to be careful, you know, because the Bible says that as human beings, our tendency is to want to shape God into something that we want him to be rather than how he actually is. And it might be tempting to think of the Holy Spirit as an energy or a power because he becomes something that we can channel and use for our own ends. But the Holy Spirit is God. He will do what he wants to do. He is a personal divine being. One of the most important descriptions of the Holy Spirit comes from the Lord Jesus in these chapters in in John, in John chapter 14 to 17. On the night before he died, Jesus was preparing his disciples for his death. He was 
teaching them. He was speaking to them, telling them that he's going to leave and, and preparing them uh, for all the things that were going to happen to them. Look down with me to chapter 16, verse 6, page 1084. Jesus says, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Why is it good that Jesus goes away? Because he says, then the advocate will come. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Later on, he describes the advocate as the spirit of truth. Now, advocate is probably a word that we don't use very often. It's not a word that I use very often. It's talking about someone who is sent to help us. In John 14, a few chapters earlier, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit a helper. He's someone who will come alongside the disciples. In fact, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' very presence with them. You see, Jesus was going to leave them physically. But he says he will send the disciples, if you look carefully in uh, verse, uh, actually on the handout in chapter 14, he says he's going to send them another advocate. Jesus was the first advocate, but he's going to send, after he's gone, he's going to send someone else who would be his very presence with them. Just on the screen, um, Romans chapter 8 Uh, Let me just read out these verses and just listen for how the Holy Spirit is described. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in, in Rome and he says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Do you see how the Holy Spirit is described? The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. In fact, if the Holy Spirit is in us, we have Christ himself in us. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' very presence with us. You know, in John chapter 16, the disciples were scared. They were anxious. They were troubled. They were perhaps feeling worried about being left on their own. They were maybe feeling overwhelmed of all the things that Jesus had said were going to happen. They were worried about the loss of their friend, their Lord. They were worried about all that lay ahead. How were they going to serve God without Jesus with them? How could they hope to continue his work after he's gone? Jesus says he'll send his very presence to be with them. He won't leave them on their own. I'm sure that that all of us have felt all these things as well. Maybe even this morning. Overwhelmed. Grief. Anxiety. Loneliness. Maybe we've wondered how can I possibly be up to the task of serving the Lord Jesus? How can I hope to keep on following him? Jesus has given us his very presence to be with us. If you're a Christian this morning, however far you might feel from Jesus, he is with you. He's given you the Holy Spirit whose job is to come alongside you, the helper. He dwells in you. I wonder what difference it might make to you, to me, to all of us this week to remember as you sail through the week or maybe as you struggle through the week that Jesus is with you. We're not on our own. What in particular does he help us with? That's point number two, the work of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see there are six headings on the welcome sheet. And before we look at those six headings, I want us to just think, what is the big picture summary of the Spirit's work? If we could could summarize the Holy Spirit's work under one heading, what would it be? I think the answer is in John chapter 16 and verse 14. Let me just read from verse 12 
again. Jesus says, I have much more to say to you than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now there are several things that we could say about the work of the Holy Spirit from those verses. But verse 14, the key thing, the big picture summary. The Spirit's work is to glorify Jesus. He's a serving spirit. You see it in verse 13 as well. He doesn't speak on his own. He speaks what he hears. He speaks what Jesus gives him to speak. If you look at the top of the page, chapter 15, verse 26, page 1084, Jesus says, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So you see, the spirit's work is never to draw attention to himself. The Spirit's work is about drawing attention to Jesus. His job is to help us fix our eyes on Jesus. Which means if we, if we ask ourselves the question, how could I spot somebody who's received the Holy Spirit? How would I know? How would you spot whether somebody has the Holy Spirit working in them? You know, the answer wouldn't, first and foremost, be to do with their gifts. It wouldn't be to do with whether or not they were a good preacher or how well they knew the Bible. The mark of the Spirit's work in someone's life would be that they are treasuring Christ, devoted to Christ, trying to be like Christ, following Christ. That's the Spirit's work, to cause us to fix our eyes On the Lord Jesus. If you look at the the six headings that we're going to look through now, I hope we'll see that's the case. That's exactly what he does. So, first, uh, he causes us to believe in Jesus. The Spirit convicts us of our sinfulness. Look down to chapter 16, verse 8. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit helps us to see what we're really like. You know, in my my house, um, if we know that someone is coming round, we try and make an effort to tidy up, um, as, as you do. But actually, we don't really tidy up. What we do is we take as much of the mess as we possibly can and put it in one big pile, and then we take that one big pile and just put it somewhere else that you can't see. So it looks tidy, but if people really knew where to look, then they would see that things are not really what they seem. And we're like that as human beings, aren't we? You know, we can make ourselves look good to other people, and we can even fool ourselves. But the Bible says we love darkness. The Holy Spirit exposes our sinfulness. He opens all the doors and the cupboards, if you like, and he helps us to see what we're really like. And not only that, he convinces us that what we're like is wicked in God's eyes, which is an essential first step, isn't it, in coming to Jesus. No one will come to Jesus for salvation unless unless they realize they need it. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin And the Holy Spirit gives us new life. Just um, turn back a few pages to John chapter 3, page 1065. Keep your finger in John 16 if you can. Sorry if you've lost it already. Um, Try and keep hold of it. We'll come back. But John 3, this is the, the famous discussion between Nicodemus, the Pharisee, and Jesus. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he wants to know more about who he is and and the kind of things that he's saying, the claims that he's making about the kingdom of God. So let's jump in at verse three. Jesus replied to him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus is 
He's telling Nicodemus, look, you're not going to be able to understand who I am or anything about this kingdom that I'm bringing unless you're born again. Then look down to verse 5 and 6. Jesus says that being born again is a work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Jesus isn't saying you need to be a better person to see the kingdom of God. He's not saying you need to turn over a new leaf. He is saying something more radical than that. Jesus is saying that anyone who wants to be part of his kingdom needs to be remade. They need to be a whole new person, a new creation. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings regeneration. Which means, you know, that every single Christian must have and does have the Holy Spirit. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you might hear people speak of receiving the Holy Spirit as something that happens after you become a Christian. But every Christian has received the Holy Spirit. No one can become a Christian without receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit causes us to believe in Jesus. He convicts us of our sin. He gives us new life. Secondly, the Spirit helps us to know Jesus better. So come back to John 16, uh, if you've got it there, uh, page 1084 again. And just look down to verse 12, chapter 16, verse 12. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So after he's gone, the Holy Spirit is going to to teach them. He'll guide them into all truth. What truth is Jesus talking about? Well, verse 14 says, He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Spirit will take the truth about Jesus and from Jesus and he'll make it known. Not directly to us, but to the disciples. This is a promise for them, not a promise for us. Jesus isn't promising every single Christian will have truth about him zapped into them. He is saying that the Holy Spirit will teach the disciples. He'll give them revelation. And in turn, they will write it down in the scriptures. That's how the Spirit helps us to know Jesus better. He gives revelation to the apostles. They write it down and we can now read it and and know it as well. We can read the truth they were given every time we open up the Bible. He gives them revelation. He gives us illumination. Illumination. You see, we, we have the truth of the apostles, don't we? But but we also need help to understand it. We need the Spirit's help. Let, let, me, um, let me borrow an illustration from somebody else to, to explain what I mean. Imagine um, a stained glass window, and imagine that all the truth about Jesus could be sort of contained in that stained glass window. It's as if the, the Holy Spirit has helped the apostles to, to create that stained glass window. He's helped them to, to put it together. But if you look from the outside, it's completely dark. You can't, you can't understand what the picture is. What we need is the Holy Spirit to, to shine a light through the window so that we can see and understand what God is saying. The Spirit has given the apostles revelation. We need him to give us illumination. I'm sure that there are times you find the Bible hard to understand. I do, all the time. And perhaps if we're honest, you know, there are times that we find it boring and dull. The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is with us. 
We need God's help. We need to pray. We need to ask him to help us by his spirit to illuminate his word so that we can understand it. I wonder, you know, wouldn't it make a difference this week as you perhaps struggle through your Bible reading? Wouldn't it make a difference to remember Jesus is with you as you read? He's given you his spirit to help you, to be with you. So ask God to help you by his spirit to understand and to trust what he says. The spirit helps us to know Jesus better. Thirdly, the the spirit applies what Jesus accomplished. The spirit applies what Jesus accomplished. Think about this question. How how does what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago, how does that become something which makes a difference to your life in 2023? You know, on the cross, the Lord Jesus won salvation for us. He met the requirements of the law. He satisfied God's justice. He secured every spiritual blessing. But how does all of that become yours? How do we enjoy the benefits of what Christ accomplished? Well, it's through the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who who unites us to Jesus, who brings us into God's family so that we can all enjoy the blessings of being his children. God the Father planned our salvation. God the Son accomplished our salvation. God the Holy Spirit applies that salvation to us so that we can enjoy all its benefits. Fourthly, the Spirit makes us more like Jesus. I don't know, well, I I think you'd agree with me that changing things is hard, isn't it? Changing things about yourself is hard. I don't know whether you've resolved to do anything different in 2023 compared to 2022. Have you stuck with it? Being different is hard. And do you know why being different is hard? Because do you know what? On the 1st of January, 2023, you are the same person as you were on the 31st of December, 2022. Just the same person. And if change in general is difficult, then godliness must be even harder. You know, rooting out sin and trying to get rid of it is hard. I wonder if you ever feel like it's a pointless battle that you never seem to win. Sometimes I think we forget, I think I forget, how different we are as Christians now as compared to when, before we knew Jesus. You know, maybe when you became a Christian, you you didn't really feel very different. But listen to Paul in in Romans chapter 8 again. Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You see, when you became a Christian, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead started to work in you. The spirit who gave Jesus new life has given new life to you. I think Paul's especially talking about future glory, the the kind of new creation. But then he goes on, he gives some implications for what it means in the here and now. He says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body... You will live. Do you see the implication? Paul's saying 
One day in the future, we will be raised to new life. We'll have new bodies. We'll be new creations. But even now, the Spirit's life-giving power is at work in us, transforming us. We can and and we must strive to get rid of, of the sin that belongs to our old way of life. And by the Spirit's transforming power, In us, we can live out our new identity as God's children. You might not feel any different to before, but you are radically different because of the Holy Spirit. As you struggle with sin this week, ask God to help you by his Spirit to fight, to put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. God doesn't call you to fight sin and then just not give you the means to do it. Wouldn't it make a difference this week to remember as you strive for godliness, Jesus is with you in it. You're not alone. Fifthly, the Spirit equips us to serve Jesus. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 7. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Holy Spirit gives gifts, abilities to every believer for the common good, to to build up the church. You know, of of all the different aspects of the Holy Spirit's work, this is perhaps the place, isn't it, where there is most disagreement amongst Christians. There's disagreement about what the gifts are. What are the gifts of tongues? What are the gifts of prophecy? There's disagreement about whether those gifts still occur today. I'm not going to say anything about those questions. Except two things. Two things. Let me say two things. First thing... We would do well to remember the purpose of these gifts is not for someone's own experience, but it is for the building up of believers to serve Jesus. So so whatever you think the gifts might be, that is what they're for. They are for the building up of believers. And actually, you know, anytime you read a list of gifts in the New Testament, it's not exhaustive. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. The fact is, whenever you see anybody serving their brothers and sisters, that's the work of the Spirit. It doesn't need to be something impressive or miraculous or spontaneous. When anyone serves their brothers or sisters, that is the Spirit's work. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. Just to say that I think it would be short-sighted of us if our understanding of the Spirit's work was limited to talking about these kinds of things because I hope you can see from the extremely long handout that I've given you the Holy Spirit's work encompasses much more than simply this and yet the Holy Spirit does equip us to serve Jesus you know God calls us to serve him but he doesn't leave us on our own if you feel overwhelmed by the thought of serving Jesus if you feel ill-equipped Well, remember, Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit to help us to serve him. Finally, as we finish, last one. The Spirit is our guarantee that we will meet Jesus. Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. I don't know if you've ever put a deposit down for something, a car maybe, um, you know, when I was much younger, much younger, I remember putting a deposit down for a computer games console. And then months later, when it was released, and I could see everybody else queuing up, desperate to get their console, I was very excited that I could just walk in and pick up uh, the computer games console that I'd already put my deposit down for. 
my deposit guaranteed that I would get it. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. We've been marked with a seal, like an elaborate letter sealed with wax on the back showing who sent it. Because we have the Holy Spirit, we are marked, we're owned by God. He's given us the Holy Spirit to say this is just the beginning. There's much more to come. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee that we will meet Jesus. He's he's, his very presence with us. But one day we will see him face to face. You can be sure of it. As we finish, just think about this, that being a Christian is costly. Being a Christian is walking a a narrow path. It perhaps feels uphill a lot of the time. God has told us to count the cost of being a Christian, but he's not left us on our own. He's not asking us to do the impossible. He's given us the Holy Spirit to be with us every step of the way, to help us know Jesus, to love Jesus, to be like Jesus, to be able to serve Jesus, to help us until we meet Jesus. Let me pray. Let's thank God for his gift of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, would you